Okay, in this section, we'll take a look at some more examples of simple linear regression, the ideas we laid out in the last lecture section, and we'll apply this to a few more data examples. Just one thing to know about the semantics of all this. Sometimes linear regressions performed with a single predictor, 1x, are called simple linear regressions. I've never liked that terminology. It implies that these things should be easier than other types, which isn't necessarily the case. But nevertheless, when you hear reference to simple linear regression, it just simply means there's one predictor x. Linear regressions performed with more than one predictor, more than one x, are called multiple linear regressions, and we'll be looking at those in Lecture 5, an extension of what we're doing here. But in this set of lectures, we are dealing with simple linear regression, and in this section we will give three more examples. So here's an example from clinical medicine relating somebody's hemoglobin levels to what's called their packed cell volume measurement. And these were data on laboratory measurements on a random sample of clinic patients between the years of 20 and 67 years old. And we actually only had 21 subjects, so it's a small sample. But the question that the researchers want to assess is what is the relationship between hemoglobin levels measured in grams per deciliter, and packed cell volume, which is the percentage, theoretically, from 0 to 100 percent that measures the percent of cells that are packed. So the data looks like this on these 21 subjects. The mean hemoglobin levels across the 21 persons is 14.1, with a standard deviation of 2.3, and a range from 9.6 to 17.1 grams per deciliter. The packed cell volume, the mean is 41.1 percent, the standard deviation about 8% in the range 25 to 55%. And here's a scatter plot display of hemoglobin versus packed cell volume for these 21 subjects. Do you see anything there? Do you think it may be appropriate? I mean, there does seem to be, I don't want to force my opinion on you, but there does seem to be some sort of trend that is the X, that is packed cell volume, increases. There's a trend in increasing hemoglobin, and we might be able to capture that shift of the mean with a line. And it turns out if you fit a regression line to this data, the equation of the regression line relating estimated mean hemoglobin levels to packed cell volume, and we'll show you how to do this in data, I promise, in the next lecture section, but now you just have to take it as given, is estimated mean hemoglobin level y hat is equal to 5.77, that's the intercept, plus 0 0.20 times x. And again, y hat is the estimated average hemoglobin level, what we previously call y bar, if you will. x is height, our intercept is 5.77, and our estimated slope is 0 0.2. So let's, let's look at the slope for a minute. Let's, before we even interpret it, let's just be clear on what the units are. This equation, when we plug in an x value and multiply it by 0.2 and then add it to 5.77, we're supposed to come out with a, something in the units of hemoglobin, grams per deciliter. And the units of packed cell volume, our x, is in percent. So beta 1 has to be in units that multiply by percent to give us grams per deciliter. And the units of beta 1 are grams per deciliter per percent. So the results estimate that the mean difference in hemoglobin levels for two groups of subjects who differ by 1% in packed cell volume is 0.2 grams per deciliter. That's the average difference between any two groups who differ by 1%. And the subjects with it, just to make it clear that this difference is positive, a positive association, you could say subjects with greater PCB have greater hemoglobin levels on average, that this comparison, positive 0.20, is to the greater packed cell volume to the lesser. Here's a scatter plot display with the regression line. So you can see that there's still a lot of variability around the points, but it looks like we've captured maybe the essence of that relationship, that the average does follow a line reasonably well. What if we wanted to use these results to compute not the average difference for subjects who differ by 1% in packed cell volume, but who differed by 8%? For example, a group of subjects with packed cell volume of 40% compared to a group of subjects with 32%. Well, recall our slope here is 0.2, compares groups of subjects who differ in packed cell volume by 1%, and it's positive, so those with greater packed cell volume have hemoglobin levels of 0.2 grams per deciliter greater on average. So if we wanted to compare subjects with a packed cell volume of 40%, 
versus subjects with 32%, that's an eight unit difference in X. So we take the difference in X values, eight, and multiply it by the difference in hemoglobin levels for a one unit difference to get that difference for an eight unit difference. And it turns out that estimate is 1.6 grams per deciliter. We can also use this equation to find the point on a line in other words, estimate the mean for any group of subjects with a fixed value of hemoglobin. So if I ask you, what is these regression results? Estimate the mean hemoglobin level for subjects with 41% packed cell volume. How could we do that? Well, we can just plug 41% straight into the equation and crank out a number. And if you do that, the estimated mean, which is the point on the line where x equals 41, is almost 14 grams per deciliter. It's 13.97. So before we move on, I'm not going to write this out here, but what is the interpretation of that intercept of 5.77? And does it have any relevance other than being a necessary placeholder, as we talked about in the last section? Well, technically, it would be the estimated hemoglobin level for persons with a packed cell volume of 0%. And that can't happen in real life. And secondly, our data set, the range of packed cell volume is 25% to 55%. So this is not a scientifically useful number but it is necessary for us to fully specify this equation. Here's another example. The data on hourly wages from a random sample of 534 U.S. workers. And this is in the year 1985, which is well over 20 years ago at this point. Wow. So the question is, what is the relationship between hourly wage in U.S. dollars and the years of formal education. And just some summary data on all these folks. These is, remember, this is 1985. The hourly wages, the average for this set of 534 workers was about $9 per hour, but there's a lot of variation in those individual values, about $5 per hour. And the range is anywhere from a dollar per hour, which probably includes people in the service industry, like waiters and waitresses who work off of tips. It's about what I got paid when I was a waiter, to about $44.50 per hour at the upper end. The years of education, formal education, the average in this sample was actually 13 years, which in the U.S. would be 12 years would indicate completing high school. So this would be slightly more than completion of high school, so some college on average. But with a standard deviation of 2.6 years and a range anywhere from 2 years to 18 years, which would be high school, college, and some graduate work at least. Here's a scatter plot display. It's just not as clean cut as what we saw before, but there's a lot of clustering. But what we see here, I think, is some evidence that the average wage may increase with years of education, albeit it's not as clear from a picture like this. But it doesn't seem outrageous, at least, to fit a line to this type of picture. And it turns out if we do that, the equation of the regression line we get relating estimated mean hourly wages to years of education from state, of course, is y hat equals negative 0.75 plus 0.75 times x. And here at y hat is the estimated average hourly wage. x is the years of formal education. The intercept estimate is negative 0.75, and the slope estimate is positive 0.75. It's just a coincidence that they have the same absolute value. And again, this is estimated line from a sample of 534 subjects. And here's a scatter plot display with regression line. And you see it actually, there is an increasing trend there, or so it seems, but there's still a lot of variability in the wages for any given year, even after we've predicted differing means by years of education. Let's go back to the arm circumference example. I'm going to show you that even though we made a big deal about the ability, the regression giving us the ability to incorporate continuous predictors into situations where we're comparing means between groups, allows us to find those groups via a continuous measure. We aren't restricted to continuous measures. And in fact, we'll see that we can do the things we used to do, like a two-sample t-test, which is also a method for comparing means and estimating mean differences. We can do that as a regression. We're allowed to have predictors or x's that are not continuous. We can have predictors that are binary. So remember, we were looking at in the prior section data on anthropomorphic measures from a random sample of 150 Nepali children less than a year old. Another question we might have about arm circumference is what is the relationship between the average arm circumference and sex of the child in this sample and extrapolating that to the population from which we've sampled? 
And just recall the arm circumference, the mean in this group of children was about 12.4 centimeters, and the range was 7.3 to 15.6. And the, the sex distribution of the sample was roughly even. 51% were female and 49% male. Here's a scatter plot display of the relationship between arm circumference and sex. Now, that's kind of funny looking, isn't it? It's very different than what we saw before. Why is that? Well, Rx can only take on two values here. And it's really, there's a lot of empty space in this graph, and it's not really easy to see if there's any discernible difference in the distributions for males and females with a presentation like this. So although this is totally a legal visual tool, I would suggest that a better way to look at the same relationship would be to do a box plot. And now we can see a little bit more richness in our data. You'll notice now that it seems like the median arm circumference for males is higher than that for females, but there's also more variability in these measures. So we, at least we get some sense of what's going on by looking at this, I think more so than that scatter plot. Scatter plots are useful when your x is continuous, but a little hard to interpret when it's binary. So let's think about that. Here, our outcome of interest, the thing whose mean we want to estimate, is arm circumference, a continuous measure. X here is not continuous, as with all the other examples we looked at, but it's binary, male or female. How do you think we can handle this in a regression? How can we make something binary, turn it into numerical values? Here's one possibility. Why don't we make X equal to 0 for male children and X equal 1 for female children? This is arbitrary, of course. We could have done the opposite as well. And the equation we will estimate, y hat, is y hat equals beta naught plus beta 1 hat times x, just like we've done before. But how are we going to interpret the regression coefficients when our x is binary? Well, you notice this, this is a lot of the do about nothing in some sense. This equation is ultimately only estimating two values, the mean arm circumference for male children and the mean for female children, right? There's only two values of x. There's only two values of our predictor. And let's just see what this equation looks like when we focus in on these two sets of children. Well, for female children, whose x value we've assigned to be 1, y hat equals b naught hat plus b1 hat times that value of 1. So the average arm circumference for female children in this sample is a combination of the intercept plus the slope. But for male children, whose x value is 0, all we get in the estimated mean arm circumference is the intercept, b naught hat. So look at this. There's, these are only two possible estimates from this equation. And what's the only difference in those two estimates? It's that slope of b1 hat. So b1 hat, it's still a slope. It's estimating a mean difference in y for a one unit difference in x. But because x only has two values, the only possible one unit difference is 1 to 0. So it's still technically a slope, but there's only one incremental change in the x values. Interestingly enough, the intercept here has substantive meaning in this example because as we've shown, it is the average arm circumference for male children. So sometimes it does take on a value that's useful in the interpretation of results and not just a placeholder. All right, so the resulting equation from state, of course, is y hat, our estimated mean arm circumference, equals this intercept of 12.5 plus negative 0.13 times x, the height. So our slope here is negative 0.13. What units is it in? Well, it's actually in centimeters per centimeter because both the outcome arm circumference and the height are measured in centimeters. So it's negative 0.13 centimeters of arm circumference per centimeter of height. So this number is the estimated mean difference in arm circumference for female children compared to male children it's negative 0.13 centimeters. Female children have lower arm circumference by 0.13 centimeters on average. And look here, the intercept of 12.5 is actually a useful number in this case, as we said before. It's the mean arm circumference for male children in this sample. So here's a question for you to think about. It was absolutely arbitrary how we coded the sex of the child. We chose to make x equal 1 for females and zero for males. What do you think the results would have been regression-wise? See if you can think about what the results would have been regression-wise had we coded it in the opposite direction, one for males and zero for females. You might be thinking, well, you said this was a line, John, linear regression. Where is the line when your x only takes on two values? Well, here it is. It's not very dramatic here, but basically, it's the line that connects the mean for all male subjects 
to the mean for all females. And the slope of that line is the difference in means for female relative to male. And you can't really see it in this picture because it's so small relative to the range, but that is a negative slope of 0.13 centimeters. In the next section, I promise you we'll get to doing some stata, and we'll also Everything we've been doing and the results we're showing are estimates from imperfect subsamples from larger populations. So, of course, like, like everything we've seen before, there's going to be uncertainty in the picture. And so in the next section, we'll get into how to handle the uncertainty and do things like confidence intervals and hypothesis tests.